Hello. Now, the problem with having so many smart people in a room is it's really hard to get them to all calm down. <laughs> okay, we're going to start now. And that had no effect whatsoever. That's, that's, uh, that, uh, okay. Lower it by an, okay, all right, okay. We need, that, uh, I, I was speaking into the microphone. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you, everyone. Particularly, thank you, Ben. Uh, uh, it's great, great, great to be back. Um, when I said uh, 350, I didn't actually mean it. Um, uh, we're having uh, one more plenary panel uh, today before we split off into the tracks, um, and this one is focused a little bit differently than what we did before. Uh, in that, rather than talking specifically about how we go about implementing a personal health record, uh, we've asked uh, four representatives of four in many cases, fairly different and sometimes even non-traditional stakeholder groups within personal health records to join us and talk about how they put their organizations into the role of a customer of an interoperable PHR infrastructure. Uh, so uh, we have here today um, Dr. Michael Sayer, who is a program officer at the NIH National Center for Research Resources, where he works to build biomedical research and informatics capacity and uh, developing academic uh, uh, capacity at academic institutions. Uh, prior to joining NIH, Dr. Sayer was a faculty member at Johns Hopkins University, where he studied fundamental mechanisms of gene regulation, so getting a little ahead of ourselves, but that's next year. Um, and, uh, and his PhD degree is from the uh, University of California at San Diego. Um, Dr. Michael Brown is the Chief Information Officer at Harvard University Health Services, where he, unders where he oversees the University Health Service uh, Information Department. Uh, so Harvard University Health Service uh, completed a transition to paperless medical records back in 2005. And so Dr. Brown is not only an MD and a CIO, uh, he also lives along with his family on the campus at Harvard. So he has an extremely strong incentive to maintain the health of that population. Uh, but, uh, 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 we're also very uh, fortunate to have with us Dr. Bradley Perkins, uh, MD, MBA, um, who is the Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer um, in the Office of Strategy and Innovation in the Office of the Director at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, so his, uh, his title is even longer than mine. Um, and uh, Dr. Perkins' CDC career um, goes back many years and involved uh, uh, substantial roles in uh, rapid response, laboratory response networks, uh, and a major role with the World Health Organization. Um, and then finally, to take the perspective, and note that not, not in any order here, but um, to take the uh, to, order that I wrote it down in, um, to take the perspective of an employer and a large healthcare payer, uh, we have Omid Mogadam from Intel Corporation, who is the Director of Personal Health Record Programs at Intel, and he'll tell us a little bit more about, uh, about what his uh, role at Intel has been. Um, so without further ado, I'm actually going to ask Dr. Perkins to start, assuming I can find his presentation. Thanks very much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here today with you. Um, it's uh, CDC's 60th anniversary uh, this year, and, and the good news is we're closing out our 60th year as the nation's most trusted uh, federal agency, which we're very proud of. The bad news is that unfortunately puts us only at the top of the bottom of the heap uh, in terms of uh, public trust, and, and many organizations like Harvard uh, and Intel uh, are, are much more higher on the public trust uh, in index than, than CDC. Um, I wanted to point out uh, Blake Caldwell and Bill Kassler, who are senior CDC people that are here with me, and if you want to ask CDC for money, you can, you can check with them. <laughs> um, you know, we've increasingly been talking about CDC's uh, operational responsibilities in two broad realms. The first, we've been characterizing as urgent realities. And those are the obesity, the diabetes, the heart disease, injury, the other diseases of known burden. The other large operational responsibility that CDC has is for urgent threats. And the one most uppermost on people's mind right now is pandemic influenza, but also like things like hurricane response and bioterrorism. Um, you know, CDC's business model, if you will, since this is a diverse, a diverse crowd, I can, I can use that terminology, I think, is fairly simple. Um, it's really four steps. 
Uh, we like to monitor health conditions uh, in the United States and uh, at the global level, and we think we do a reasonable good, reasonably good job doing that. Um, we use that information basically to create or assemble knowledge uh, that allows us to intervene on those conditions. Um, we then try to implement programs in both the urgent realities and urgent threats domain that have an impact, a health impact. Uh, the fourth step in that process is to monitor and see that we're actually having the impact that, that we hope to have. If you look at that as sort of a business process and you, you look at where the, the, the rough spots in productivity are, um, I would say that there's rough spots right now around surveillance, the collection of health monitoring information, and implementation of interventions, both for urgent realities and urgent threats. We think the personal health record uh, offers an incredible opportunity for CDC and all of public health to have a surge and increase in productivity that can markedly accelerate the health impact that we have. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit um, about some of the transformation efforts that have been ongoing at CDC over the last couple of years by, by letting you know something about our six strategies and four goals that we're currently operating under. And this is a fairly remarkable shift for the agency. And I think it's reflective of a lot of the comments that were made about patient-centered care and the personal health record. The first is that we are aligning everything we do to create health impact. And again, this is this productivity uh, commitment that CDC is making to have more health impact through improved quality of delivery around our work process at a decreased cost. Customer centricity, that's probably the most controversial part of CDC's transformation over the last year, or last couple of years, but I think probably the most important. Um, with this strategic imperative, we have made the commitment to transition from, from what has traditionally been CDC's primary customer as state and local government, governmental public health agencies to the public. And as many of you will recognize, that has extraordinary implications. We want to continue to prioritize our unique brand of translational public health research. The fourth, the leadership imperative is important. We constructed these strategic imperatives by going out and asking people what they wanted from CDC. About 500 unique stakeholders and a number of public um, focus groups. And what we heard is, CDC, you're doing a reasonable job providing leadership in the governmental public health sector. But we actually want you to provide leadership across the entire health system. Okay? And I'll come back to this a little later because I'm going to advocate to you that actually prevention is the holy grail for health system transformation and that CDC and the personal health record are extremely well positioned to drive that transformation. Global health impact. Um, our brand is actually stronger uh, globally than it is nationally. When China um, um, transformed their Ministry of Health, um, they did it replicating CDC, but not only replicated our structure, they named it CDC, although it has no meaning in Chinese. Um, and so there are about 3,000 regional CDCs across China right now, which I think is sort of the ultimate uh, accomplishment. Um, um, uh, the last strategic imperative is accountability. And, and when we say that combined with health impact focus, we're really talking about alignment of our resources to accelerate health impact and doing that in a transparent way. And there's going to be a lot of stuff happening out of CDC to action on that, that uh, over the next year. As part of the implementation of these strategic imperatives, we have four overarching goals, and the entire CDC budget now is aligned to these overarching goals. We're constructing objective measures to support this. But these are, these are revolutionary, I think. Um, basically, healthy people in every stage of life were working, instead of a disease-based or risk factor-based modality, we're going to work in a life stage-based modality. We've made a commitment to assemble CDC uh, products and services in life stages rather than around specific diseases. We think that this is going to be a very powerful way to prioritize uh, and accelerate CDC's health impact and is obviously very customer-centric. 
um, healthy people in healthy places. This is doing what we are committing to do for people for places in our environmental realm of work. Um, just as we're committing to assemble programs that are relevant, most relevant to adolescents in a unified whole, we've identified seven places, and they're the seven places where all of us spend essentially all of our time, homes, work, community, uh, hospitals, um, schools. Um, we're going to basically integrate our pro products and services along that framework, um, just like we're doing for life stages. Preparedness is a different uh, can of worms, and this is basically a commitment to measure the time and quality of our response uh, in urgent response, re urgent response situations uh, throughout the public health system. We've got some very exciting things going on with, with Google and some of the, the GIS mapping in that regard right now. And finally, healthy people in a healthy world uh, to characterize our global agenda. I wanted to characterize, and I've only got eight slides, so um, I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. I wanted to characterize a couple of sentinel events um, and, and explain to you why I think they're so important. This is um, uh, a slide about the National Governors Association meeting in February of this year. And, and basically, 48 governors, one of the highest attendance uh, they've ever had at one of these conferences, got together to talk about healthy America, basically creating health in the places we live, work, and learn. Um, and they did that uh, by basically assembling uh, a public health agenda. And I want to push back a little bit on the payer being the center of the universe, because I think there's actually something much more important going on. And um, I'd like to believe these governors assembled out of altruistic concerns about the health of, of the people that they serve. And I think there was some of that. But the real driver here, I think, is US economic uh, um, competitiveness. And what people recognize, what these 48 governors recognized, is that our current trajectory in health care, in our health system, is non-sustainable that we're spending twice as much per capita as any developing country currently and getting less value um, than about 35 countries that are spending less than half of that, that amount of money. We're comfortably down with Belarus and, and Latvia about where we are with our mass scores. Um, and so really what these governors came together to talk about was what they could do in response to the looming economic uh, crisis um, uh, uh, underscored by, by um, the health problems that, that we're having. Actually, Governor Huckabee, is there anybody from Arkansas here? Nobody from Arkansas? Oh, good, good. Um, because, I mean, it's been a spectacular run uh, under his leadership. And, and um, you know, I love his quotes that he started with, basically, that, you know, we need to, uh, instead of sending an ambulance to the bottom of the cliff, we need to start building guardrails at the top. Um, and, and that basically his characterization that U.S. culture has become a professional football game with 22 men on the field in desperate need of uh, rest and 70,000 in the stands in desperate need of exercise. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you you got to count on the politicians for these pithy, but I mean, I think, I, I, you know, I think that that's a great quote. Um, and, and Secretary Levitt spoke. And, he basically uh, talked in ways that I think were completely uncompromising about the gravity of the situation and, and reflecting you know, the underlying premise of Tom Friedman's book, The World is Flat. He considers the healthcare crisis right now to be a change or be eliminate from competition at the global level uh, sort of crisis. Um, there was a lot of presentation to public health data about the march of the obesity epidemic and, and actually some shock and awe uh, by David Katz, who's the director of the Prevention Research Center at Yale University, when he described the trajectory of uh, children developing diabetes, two, type two diabetes. I can't say that now because I can't use the terms that I used to when I trained. Can't use adult onset and child, child onset anymore. Uh, but basically, he described his trajectory as a result of the current epidemic in diabetes, where we are likely to expect 
uh, colleges and graduate uh, schools around the country to start seeing myocardial infarctions and kidney failure as a result of long-standing diabetes. Um, that's the degree of catastrophe we're looking at if we don't address the obesity and the comorbidities that go along with obesity in the United States. On the urgent threat side, um, uh, basically Secretary Levitt and governors across the country have convened in all 50 states to talk about pandemic influenza, which is basically um, the equivalent of a biologic forest fire. We're, we're underprepared um, and overdue for an epidemic. Uh, things are getting better, but this is a huge risk, not only to the health of our nation, but to the economic well-being of our nation. And um, although our just-in-time supply uh, chains have brought us great economic uh, prosperity, they are a Achilles heel in the context of a serious pandemic influenza in the, uh, pandemic in the United States. There's another thing happening, and I struggle with how to portray this, but there's another thing happening with consumer demand. Um, and I think there's a huge consumer demand that the healthcare system and the public health system is not really meeting in terms of, of, um, of the consumer demand for wellness in the United States. And these are data you wouldn't normally see at a, at a science meeting, um, uh, but these are actually from a private equity firm that invests in health and wellness sectors across the United States. And, and they estimate the current, um, the current spending on health and, and wellness in the United States to be about $562 billion, which actually approaches, you know, comes close to CMS's uh, budget. Which CMS's budget right now? $450 billion, so it exceeds CMS's uh, budget. And it would be my hypothesis that, that if we can capture the demand that's evident in these economic data, uh, around prevention, around the personal health record, that we will be successful in, in uh, really accelerating our health impact. And I show this slide not to advocate Intel or, or um, this as the solution, but just to indicate that we have been talking with Intel. And we've identified uh, four areas where we think that public health can add a great deal of value in the, the, the personal health record, basically in, in health decision making, basically by uh, creating a channel for delivery of our, our science and ev evidence-based health guidelines, health benchmarking, um, nobody has the kind of population-based behavioral and laboratory data that CDC has. As soon as we give people access to their own laboratory data, they're gonna wanna see how they compare nationally and this is really the gold standard uh, for that. And then it's already been mentioned, uh, repurposing de-identified data for public health use. And then we'd like at CDC um, to be um, an early adopter uh, with our employees and think we can contribute value that way and basically as a bridge for early adoption across the federal system. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And actually, if anyone is, is interested in a little bit more about um, some of the ideas for using CDC's public health information, um, they were in, CDC was involved, along with a number of other government agencies, in testimony that was delivered to the AHIC Consumer Empowerment Work Group uh, about a month and a half ago. And uh, so the written testimony, which is available on the Health and Human Services website, um, runs through that in, in some detail. So there's some, some nice follow-up opportunities. Um, Staying within government, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Michael Sarah to come up and go next. Okay, how's that? Can you hear me? Okay, higher. How's that now? Is that okay? Good enough? Okay. Um, well, first, I want to thank the organizers for squeezing me in at the last minute. 
uh, to make a brief plug for uh, the uses of personal health records in biomedical research. So what does biomed biomedical research have to do with a personally controlled health record infrastructure? So as you all know, uh, this being Harvard, um, researchers need patient information for a lot of reasons. Clinical trials. Uh, should be. No? Oh, okay. There we go. Clinical trials, outcomes, research, uh, detection of adverse events in clinical protocols, uh, phenotype information, and we're going to be hearing a lot more about that in the coming months, um, and clinical studies, population studies, epidemiology studies of various kinds. And properly structured and managed, personally controlled health records can be used uh, to provide information uh, that benefit both patients and uh, clinical investigators. So as we all know, one of the greatest advantages of the electronic health record and personal health records that are uh, evolving is that patient data can be shared between various systems, and not just provider systems, um, but also between uh, providers and uh, health uh, researchers. Uh, so this can be used for uh, preclinical studies to identify disease patterns and health disparities, and this, get, this gets back to uh, access to uh, 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 underserved populations. We heard a little bit earlier about um, the uninsured uh, folks and how they're going to get um, access to personal health records and electronic health records. And that also um, is an issue on how they will be included in uh, research. Uh, clinical trials, we can use uh, this information to identify subjects, obtain lab results, track uh, adverse events. Um, obviously, in post-marketing surveillance, there's a, a, a big um, need for this information. And as we just heard about public health, um, biosurveillance, um, and also population health. So the personal control aspect is a, a big issue for medical research. So if clinical data are personally controlled, uh, they may not be useful for most research purposes, but there are a lot of things that could be done. Um, anecdotal uh, patient self-report data can be useful for some types of research. And using the system as a means to communicate with patients is probably one of the most valuable aspects. And some examples over here on the, on the right would include questionnaires for clinical research, again getting back to um, enrollment um, and uh, diaries of symptoms, uh, getting back to adverse event reporting and so forth. So a longitudinal personal health record is a little bit different matter. It would contain the EHR data that is not under patient control. So here we have an interface between the EHR and the public health, the, the personal health record. Allow the patients to add to the data, um, although we've heard today that not many patients do when given the opportunity. But it would be interesting to know how many patients delete data. Um, and that could have a, a major impact on research studies. Um, provide histories and et cetera in a separate workspace. And you would have to clearly partition the data provided by the patient versus that provided by the uh, uh, provider's EHR system. So additional uses for these uh, personally controlled health records would include communicating with patients for clinical research. Uh, one of the main things that we're interested in is building awareness uh, with targeted information tailored to age, location, and health population. In other words, getting people engaged in the research process. Um, uh, these records, th these systems can be used to uh, request participation in clinical research, either directly or through the providers. Uh, provide a support environment for research participants. Uh, give them calendars for appointments to meet with the clinical investigators. Uh, frequently ask questions they may have about the protocols adverse events reporting, as I mentioned, um, and allow the PIs to communicate with the patients at the end of the research programs. This is a big issue in clinical research. Many patients uh, uh, or participants uh, are unhappy after the study gets published in the New England Journal of Medicine. They don't read that journal, and they never hear about the results. Um, so these personal health records can really help in that regard. Um, and provide a permanent record for patients and their physicians in case questions come up later after the uh, the uh, uh, intervention is over. And um, perhaps most importantly, a permanent longitudinal record uh, could be very valuable for follow-up and further studies. So what can we, we do to improve information exchange? Um, we need to use standardized DHR data to feed into the public health record, personal health record, excuse me, and maintain that standardization. 
provide mechanisms to extract data from PHRs for clinical research with appropriate uh, patient consent and approval, of course, and that's going to be uh, one of the big topics of discussion at this meeting. Uh, provide means for researchers to reach patients with news about the protocols and the results and request for participation uh, and follow up at conclusion of a trial and provide a way for patients to remain in touch with the investigators. Perhaps most importantly, we should all be using the same standards. Um, biomedical researchers and clinicians should use the same data standards to the fullest extent possible. Um, and moreover, standards being developed by researchers need to be integrated with clinical data and the EHR and personal health records as new technologies mature. NIH grantees, many of them are here in this room, it's one of our biggest customers, um, are continually inventing new ways to collect data and even new kinds of data. And so if these technologies are going to become incorporated in this, the standard of care down the road, uh, the, um, the, the information infrastructure has to be developed to allow that. So for example, imaging standards, new kinds of MRI modalities, uh, standards for new tests like DNA microarrays, um, gene expression profiling, that's a big issue right now with the FDA. They need to be developed and incorporated into uh, these tools before they can move into the clinic. And personal health record standards to capture the patient-provided information in a structured form so that researchers can use it. And we need to work together especially hard uh, to improve, uh, to, to ensure that metadata requirements adopted by the EHR community include the specificity needed for research and work with all stakeholders, including industry stakeholders, to achieve inclusion of standardized metadata in electronic health records and personal health records. I work with the research community as new terminologies evolve so they can be mapped onto existing terminologies to allow interoperability and integration into EHRs and THRs. And work with the PHR community to ensure that involving systems capture data in a standardized way. And we need to work especially hard to gain patient trust in the clinical research enterprise. So I'll just leave you with this, uh, this comment. This, this is NIH's perspective. Um, advances in patient care ultimately come from research across the health sciences spectrum. But it's also true that patient care outcomes uh, shape the research agenda at every level, from prevention to detection to intervention to outcomes analysis. <coughs> so wide adoption of electronic health records and personal health records that interface with them could greatly accelerate research into the origins, prevention, and treatment of diseases, but only if these tools are extensible and interoperable with research informatics uh, infrastructure and tools. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the contributors, um, Gene Stanford at MITRE, who's here in the audience. Uh, you want to wave, Gene? Okay, so many of you know her. Jody Sachs and Elaine Collier at NCRR, and Terry Cullen, who recently became the CIO of the Indian Health Service. Thanks. Sorry about the mic problem. I'll leave it on for you. Okay, and uh, so next we have, uh, if I stand back here, I can actually get picked up by the mic. Um, yeah, after you. Uh, Dr. Michael Brown, who is the CIO of Harvard University Health Services. And so moving from research to patients. Assuming, of course, I can find a slide. Volume good? Yeah. Okay, great. I thank uh, um, the sponsors for inviting me today. I'm going to talk about personal health records in a college setting, which is uh, we've gone from a big governmental role, now we're kind of squeezing down into a smaller, a much smaller domain. Many of you might have gotten uh, health care while you were in college. That's my environment. We're a little different than the average college health service, but a number of things that I'm talking about I'm hoping are relevant to the rest of you as well. In one sense, I think we're unusual in the sense that we may have some incentives for doing a personal health record level sooner than others and may be able to be a leader in that regard. So I'm going to talk about what our incentives are for wanting to do that. And finally, when I talk about personal health record, I'm really talking more about the um, Aristotelian model. I know Aristotle, but the words, Aristotelian keeps tripping over my tongue. So excuse me if I messed up on that word I just learned today. Okay, we are about 20,000 students. 7,000 uh, employee members, 2,000 Medicare members. It's true, myself and my family, we do get our care in this uh, clinic. Uh, we provide, uh, we're a provider of care. We are also an insurer of care, so we are a plan. 
Um, we have one patient and three satellites, and as you've heard earlier, we are an electronic medical record for the last couple of years. We provide a wide range of services, including everything from pediatrics, OB, up to uh, senior care, but about half our care is related to students, the other half of care is to the rest. Well, we're part of college health, it's a little bit unusual. One of the things is that our mission is to heal, to care, to educate. And I put that up here because to educate is not the normal uh, mission. Excuse me. Look, louder? Yeah, move it up. Move it up, okay. That's good? Yeah. Um, to, to educate is a little bit unusual, but we see part of our mission is to prepare our students for their lifelong uh, self-care. The other thing is we're very similar to all the college health services, so we're hoping some of the things that are incentives for us, we can actually collaborate with other college health services we work very closely with. We're also unusual in the sense that we are not in competition with other college health centers. Uh, it's very unlikely that MIT is going to come and do a takeover of our health service. <laughs> So that brought, gives us a little bit of breathing room and a little bit of uh, comfort in collaborating with our colleagues. And we share the same uh, EMR platform with many of our colleagues. We have about um, 40 other schools on the same EMR, and they're also number on a different EMR. So that gives us some potentials as well. Our patients are a little bit unusual. Uh, they are a little more sophisticated than most, so we can put things in front of them, and they tend to figure it out reasonably well. They're extremely time constrained, which means they have uh, half hour between classes and they don't want to be have to sit around and wait so they appreciate the online environment they're online most of the time and they have high expectations in the effect of why is the rest of their life online except for their medical record you know they really didn't pay much attention to their health care when they were younger and now it's kind of like why not and so we have to meet that meet that demand I should also mention with the expectations um, our patients are unusual from the personal health record point of view because they all have a PIN number that we can access and use. So we can opt people into something a little more easily than some other environments can. Uh, in terms of privacy, some don't care that much. You know, who cares who, who cares who knows about my mental health record? And of course, I have sex. Uh, on the other hand, the other half really do think they will be president, and some of them actually will be. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the people in the business school have actually made it to the, uh, to the White House. So, but I will, what? After Yale, but I won't comment on them. <laughs> um, we do have a number of non-students, so we have to cater to that population as well. A number of international people coming through our environment. And uh, we are covered, we are the insurance plan as well, which means we don't really care if you come in for a visit because we don't get reimbursed anyway. So if we do an email or a phone call, that's care. We're responsible for a population. We're not responsible for the visit. So we actually have a patient portal as well, and it's, I'm sure it's similar to the number of the ones out there. I won't go into details about it. Um, we have just some aspects of it. We have pre-registration uh, materials. We have webmail components, which again is similar to the others. We have online appointment making, a number of administrative functions. Um, we have a big thing now with immunizations online that we're working on. And we have some abilities to do online questionnaires, although we haven't rolled that out yet. So there are a number of things we can do on our portal. So from that point of view, we're actually in pretty good shape. And uh, we don't need any consensus for anything that I've said here in the room. So we're in good shape. Have a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, there's some gaps in what we can provide and what we can do. And I want to take a few moments to talk about those. And these aren't all of our gaps that we have, but these are the ones that are related to the personal health record. Every June, about 25% of our students leave us, and all about right about the same time. And some of them want their medical records now. Some of them want them later, which is actually, frankly, even more annoying, because then they call back and say, can you send the record? And you say, can prove you're you? She sends us a signature. OK, it looks like your signature. We don't have their signatures on file. What do we know? <laughs> <laughs> so it creates a, a, a logistic issue that we have to deal with. And I hope uh, not only does it work, but actually can do it more securely through a more robust security model. Um, Excuse me? Any of them on HB board? Or HB board? Yeah. OK. Um, 
Even worse, in September, we had about 25% showing up at the same time, and we're responsible for them. They sent us their immunizations, they give us some old medical records that they might have, we have to scan them in. And it actually takes us a little while, a little over a month and a half, to actually scan this stuff in. And if they show up in the meantime, we do our best. So that's not really ideal. Um, also, anything that gets data entered in has the human factor of uh, data entry error, and we have to deal with those type of issues and the work involved in that. We do have some people actually show up with their medical record on a CD. First time that happened was a couple of years ago. Uh, a young man from Korea showed up with his medical record on a CD. And since that time, we've come up with a really good scientific method in terms of how to manage that. We print out what we care about and we scan it into the medical record. <laughs> <laughs> It's a universal standard. It's worked effectively well. But of course, it can't do the things we've talked about in terms of research, and it can't really do decision support. And the providers have to know to look in the scan document section for this or for that. So there's some negative aspects as well. And so I don't want to play that one up too much. Um, we provide wonderful care for our patients, but we don't provide all the care for our patients. We have uh, a 10-bed hospital, otherwise known as an infirmary, and our patients go across town for a number of different types of subspecialty care as well as hospitalization. And often when they do, we will print out pieces of the medical record and say, here, take this with you. And we don't know what happens after that, and we don't know what they do with it on the other side or what happens. I mean, there was someone talking earlier about the, what happens when you send your records to some other organization, what do they do with it? Well, what happens now? We send our paper records to other organizations all the time. We don't know what happens with it. So hopefully we can have a little more robustness there. Um, we don't know if it gets there. And even if it gets there, we do have the problem where we do actually have claims data. And we, we know uh, lab results are repeated, radiology results are repeated, radiology experiments are repeated. I call them experiments. Anyway, radiology is repeated, and that's not good care for the patient. You know, as a patient, I don't want to get stuck in extra time, and I don't want to get extra, more x-rays than I need. And as a plan, we're cheap. We hate paying for it. But that's the situation right now. The patients come back to us. Hopefully, we get information back before the patient shows up in the exam room with us, because it looks kind of funny to say, so what did the, what did the specialist say? But that's often what actually has to happen. Or they tell them to come back again and we'll try to get the records, which we have mechanisms in place to try to minimize, but it still happens. And uh, when we get information back, we back to the old scanning issue. Um, urgent care, people show up to urgent care and they say, here's my current problem. And um, in our case, it's not as big an issue because we've gone through all the effort of uh, getting a bunch of information in when they first start to know about their background. But in many situations, it would be very nice for a patient to say, here's my current problem, here's access to my portal, now you have my history. Um, because not every patient remembers what that green pill really is called or what they were allergic to previously. So it'd be really nice to be able to have it right then and there. If the patient did give you access to a portal, you would then eliminate the privacy concern. They're telling you, here's what you can look at, here's what you can't look at. You have identified the patient uniquely. And you also uh, minimize the, uh, one of the problems of pre-populating the record in real time by reaching out to a Rio and pulling things in real time. It's in the patient's portal. They can, it's been pre-populated um, at the uh, discretion of the patient well before they showed up to an emergency room. So I see some challenges here. Uh, standard setting is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, I would love to dictate the standards, but we're obviously not going to. We're looking forward to uh, hopefully seeing a good wave and surfing it in, but we have to figure out what direction that wave's going, and hopefully this type of meeting can help uh, push the wave in a certain direction. Um, the vendor's business model, in my case, um, we don't want to own the PHR, but we're willing to do that for a pilot site to get the system up and running. But um, I mentioned earlier that patients have a PIN number, which again, they're part of our portal, which but when they graduate, their PIN number goes away. We don't manage security of people who are no longer with us. And so we would love to have a place to put their records and let them go on in life as they wish to go on. Um, in our case, the definition of a visit is um, something which doesn't prevent us from seeing, or doesn't, we don't incentivize to do extra visits. But in a lot of the US, that is a problem. And so how can the incentives be aligned to make this more manageable? And then changing culture of control. We've, we've talked about earlier where do you put notes online or what do you put online? A lot of providers are nervous about um, this new interaction where patients have much more control than they do now and how is that whole dynamic going to work? So those are some of the issues that I see have to work through. And that was my uh, quick uh, introduction to PHRs and college health. And last but certainly not least, uh, Omid Pidal.
Да. Can you hear me in the back of the room? Okay, great. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Um, last time I was on this campus was a long time ago for the head of Charles Regatta. And back then, I had a lot, uh, a lot less weight and a lot more hair. So it was, uh, it's, it's good to be back. Uh, what I would like to actually, before I get started, the, the images you see here are shamelessly borrowed from uh, my friend David Lansky. There he is. OK, thank you. <laughs> and uh, I, I love using these because you know, they, they go to the heart of what a, what a PHR and a personally controlled health record is. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Intel, as an employer, what we got here is actually has to do with the, with the control. Our chairman, Craig Barrett, remembered from his CEO days that uh, one of the things that he, he remembered increasing every, every year. And the fact that he had absolutely no control over was the healthcare cost for US-based employees. He could not, you know, one year would be 15%, the next year would be 7%, after that it would be 12%, then it would go to 11%. There was absolutely no way of measuring what is it that we're getting for these increases. And there was no way of actually understanding of um, predicting of these increases. So that's, uh, that's how he got involved in this. And he's been involved in, for quite a while in the competitiveness issues. Brad mentioned it is about competitiveness. And um, what got us into, into the healthcare was exactly the competitiveness of US-based companies. Uh, we realized that uh, there's a cost quality disparity. We cannot measure, and we, don't, we cannot predict. Is there feedback here? Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. Move the mic up when you're trying. Oh. Is it better now? OK. You know, that threw, threw my game completely off now. You know, I have. <laughs> cost quality. Co uh, yeah, yes, yes. Cost quality disparity. And uh, thank you. <laughs> so employers pay three times into the system. You know, we, we, we buy health insurance for our employees and dependents and retirees. And you know, corporate taxes fund part of the governments. Uh, and there's a, there's a bit of cost shifting that takes place within Intel. Populations and the areas that we buy healthcare for our employees, uh, we've calculated this about 15%. That uh, the, the cost of uninsured for our employees is basically about 15%. And we realized that we have done a lot of things internally, but we really need to start focusing on the system as a whole and knew, knew to go after external factors, uh, what's happening within the US healthcare system. No, this is not working. Cell phone? OK. There's a Blackberry. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> uh, so. Realize it. Actually, you know what? Uh, I have a booming voice. I can actually, if I speak, would it be fine if I? Uh... Yeah. All right. Thank you, technology. Jeez. <laughs> so, our goal was to start working with other employers to address some of these fundamental issues. And part of it, you know, uh, there's a there's a lot of talk about consumer empowerment. And so we started doing some modeling. You know, our, our healthcare costs, they're about $400, uh, $400 million today for our US-based employees, about 50,000 people, average age of 38. So you know, they are, it's a relatively young population, but they are getting older. And we're sort of getting to the point of, of starting with a lot of chronic diseases. And if they go unchecked, um, it's a major concern for the company. And you know the, the trends as they are today, the average trend is that by about uh, 2015, it would be about a, a billion dollar bill. And uh, our HRA data that we have been running for a couple of years suggests that a lot of people don't understand that they have that risk. 
So um, people don't know that uh, you know, that, that, you know, smoking is bad for them, or or uh, high cholesterol is not a good thing. And you know, we have we have a lot of alpha types working at Intel, working very long hours, under stress, and uh, and and they're they're taking time bombs. So the some of the the market trend and sort of like optimistic scenario analysis that we did was that if, if we actually go to the market trend, that's, a, that's the top line, which was about a billion dollars for us. Uh, with some of the consumer-directed health plans, meaning that putting more information on people, understanding what they are paying for, and, uh, and you know, the plans like Luminous that we have, we've had good uptake, the cost would come down a little bit. And we try to control for quality in all of these things, that we're not actually taking anything away. It's just that people understand what they are getting. And uh, we've seen that, for example, there's been some switching from, uh, from brand name drugs to, to, uh, to generics as part of the CDHP. Uh, risk factor reduction is part of our health and wellness program. So we figure that if, if we have a certain amount of uptake rate in our health and wellness programs, we can actually bring, uh, if we correct for some of the risk factors, we can actually bring some of our costs down. And the last one, which is the market reform and IT innovation, is basically the issue of interoperability. So if you do some of those things, if you reduce your risk, but you actually have interoperability, meaning that you get the data to the point of care at the time that it's needed, it actually is going to take some of the waste out of the system. And in reality, we think that we were spending quite a bit on healthcare today. It's just that we're not focusing on the waste in the system. And, and, and that's, uh, that, that has been the main focus of our, um, of, of Craig Barrett's drive in, in efficiency and taking the waste out of the system. So this is our four pillars of, uh, uh, of uh, our, uh, our, 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 our health and wellness and healthcare strategy. I, mean, I borrowed this from our human resources people, which I work very closely with. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, we were talking about Socrates, so I like the, temp the new classical look of our, uh, of our ideas. So the four pillars, the core healthcare for all, you know, that's something that the company wants to do and is doing, best practice, first purchasing practices, that's again working with our vendors to make sure that, you know, that what we buy is actually what, what we're paying for. The, the, the two middle pillars are the ones that, that I'm most involved in. And that's the... The, the, the two pillars in the middle, thank you. <laughs> okay. I used to be put right before break, so I was in between people and their coffee, and that was, that was terrible. Now I'm after the coffee and still I can't get a break. <laughs> so the wellness and employee engagement is, you know, it's, it's basically what is that, to focus on wellness within your population, um, correcting for things that can be corrected for, chronic, um, you know, weight, Diabetes, chronic condition management actually is, is actually part of that as well. And we believe that what can bring all of these things together is a technology infrastructure that's needed. So we have two programs that we're running in this area. One of them is the focus on a personally controlled health record, which, which would be the consumer empowerment, getting the data to the right point, having the data move with people in between insurance companies, in between doctors, in between jobs, and the pay for performance, which is the other side of the coin, is working with providers to make sure that the, it's not just the inf infrastructure that, that is created for this, but people actually feed data into it from the provider point of view. And we're doing a pilot in the Bay Area, uh, along with a couple of employees, uh, Oracle and Cisco, um, around this idea of pay for performance. And the performance, part of the performance, <coughs> is feeding electronic data and using electronic data in care. So what is the IT infrastructure is that? Personal health records. Um, we started looking at personal health records. It's a new area. There's lots of utility being built over there. Um, there's potential for new models of care. There's some 200 plus vendors in this area, ranging from tethered to, to standalone. And, um, some of, the, some of the common problems with, 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 with most of the industry at this point is that data is not portable. And that goes actually to what you said, the standards. There, there doesn't seem to be a common definition of what a PHR is. There has been great work done in the CCR 
space, in, in that space by CCR. And I think that a lot of companies are starting to adopt CCR as a, as a potential standard uh, for continuance of care record. You can ask Dr. Kibbe, I think, David. <laughs> and uh, so the majority of the products out there are patient sourced, and there's little interoperable clinical data, unless you're tethered to an institution. And uh, what we really wanted was something that to automatically populate the personal health record for our employees, the data to be portable, so it can actually travel across the system, become it, so it can become your lifelong record. And transparency, we wanted transparency, that, the, you know, that everyone who has data feeds into it. And employee control and ownership of that data is very important because it needs to move in between employers as well. It has to be private and secure. I think that's the, that's the mom, mom and apple pie. Um, there are many important reasons that, that we think the person from health record would be beneficial to U.S. industry and employers. Um, it reduces the cost um, through improved management of care, especially in the case of chronic diseases. And with an aging population, like we're facing, that becomes very important. It reduces medical costs to improve compliance with prescriptions and other physicians' orders. I mean, among our population, um, compliance is about 60%, which, is, which I think is low. And if we had more chronic diseases, it would, it would be even become more catastrophic for us. Uh, reduction in redundant medical services. Uh, that's, we have talked about that, but that's one of, the, one of the areas of waste that we would like to see um, go away. We actually want to see money spent on receiving good care. Um, improving medical quality through reduction of medication interaction barriers, and we've had some of that in our population. And the last one is reducing absenteeism. I think Socrates was hard to say <laughs> through the, 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 the you know, percentage of... Aristotle. Oh, thank you, Aristotle. So going back to, uh, you know, we had a Homeric, Homeric uh, odyssey of trying to find something, tr trying to find uh, a solution to the problem that we're facing. Um, so it's just what the, what the PHR industry today looks like is, um, is a lot of proprietary, a lot of one-off um, um, links to data. And uh, you know, there is the, for example, you look at the hospital PHRs, or you look at the health plan PHRs, those fat arrows, those are direct links, and, and I think that uh, that was that window that one of the, um, I think it was Dr. Brown, that, that, that showed the window and um, uh, into, so it's basically a portal into the data that in, that institution has. So it's that relationship, is the business relationship between you and that institution. It goes away when you become, cease to become their customer. And a lot of that exists within within the pharmacy, PBM area. Um, you know, every, every pharmacy chain has its own dot, dot com portal and uh, the data is not portable. So that's the problem here, that there's really no common definition, no common framework, and, uh, and, and we believe that the, a personal control health record can be that common framework of interoperability among all of these uh, legacy systems, and it can actually become the, 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 the portal, the, the interface to a lot of new models of care, that, uh, um, that the data that exists in here can become the source of, uh, of data for, for the different types of applications, whether it being a PHR itself, whether it being health plan finance applications like Intuit or uh, is doing the hospital applications, disease management, even fitness. But we believe that this personally controlled health record becomes that source of interoperability for the consumers in the long run. So where we are, the action items, I believe that in the next couple of years, um, we're going to work with other employers to accelerate collaborative regional and national projects on both the provider side and the personal side of healthcare. Um, we believe that transparency, accountability, and pay for performance are the parts of this uh, collaborative work. And we believe that consumer ownership and portability of health data is, is critical to this. And uh, we're going to work with um, providers and provider groups to encourage computerization of their, uh, their practices. And we're going to demand portability of data for our employees. We want, we want that data to be available to our employees at the point of care. 
And um, we're going to focus on building and encouraging a common framework for these personally controlled health records, following the great work that's been done at Marco Foundation. Is there a reward for uh, for the most technically challenged person? Uh -huh. <laughs> it, it, it all worked out, but, uh, you know, and I, I'm also loud, so this, I, I like I like that approach. Um, now we we are running we are running up against a, a time, but I do want to take at least a couple of questions because we do have have a great panel up here. So um, so there's one. <laughs> um, I think it's up to Sarah from NIH who talked about concerns with a personal control of the health record, uh, reducing the utility of the data in the environment. And there seems to be a, a notion that personal control means the ability to write or rewrite data. And I'm wondering whether there needs to be some yet more kind of definitional clarity, because um, you know, I have a personally controlled business card, but the phone company gives me my phone number. I can tell you anything you want, but in the end, if I don't give you the right phone number, you're not going to get through to me. Um, and you can imagine having control over who sees the phone number, who sees the data, having control without having the ability to, to overwrite it. And so it, it's not necessarily going to aim at you, but rather in general. Does personal control mean in this environment the ability to write and rewrite and overwrite data? and edit data which is coming from uh, providers and physicians and so on. And uh, whether, it does or, whether it does or it doesn't, the question is there's confusion because we've got some speakers this assuming is, it does and some that it doesn't. This is something that's actually been discussed at the uh, Pittsby Consumer Empowerment Technical Committee. It's been discussed in until 7. Um, and I know it was a, a very key issue for uh, uh, a number of people who have also been involved with CCR. And I think the, the, the key issue is that information that is professionally sourced in a personally controlled health record would be identified as being so. The patient would not be able to change it, but they might be able to add annotations to it. Right. And I think Thank that's something that, uh, that, that uh, Keith is going to talk about in his panel at the, uh, in the next session. So, uh, so uh, but uh, any, any additions to that? Or? No. Just getting back to the, what we do now with paper. Pa you talk to, I talk to students all the time and say, the, pa the medical record is owned by the patient. Great, can the patient go in and take it home with them and destroy it? No, because there's a liability, the malpractice and all that other stuff drawn into it. So patients should have the right to control release, control access to the information, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we should enable them to commit fraud. And that's even if the patient is being difficult. Um, <laughs> I apply, wouldn't, wasn't implying that. I didn't mean to imply that. So, so the thing is, uh, it seems to me that I as a patient should be able to take my record off and effectively destroy it. So for I don't think you should be required to release anything. What I'd be afraid of is you going to another doctor and saying, Dr. So-and-so diagnosed me with this. Can you refill my morphine, please? You know? Well, uh, you'd have a hard time proving it uh, if, if the records were sort of reasonably constructed. But you can certainly say that today, and you could say that in the future. Uh, but it would show up as your own annotation. Uh, All right, that's what that's, I'm saying the same thing. I'm just saying as long as it's clear what's been done by whom, the system shouldn't be enabling a patient to say, this provider said this when the provider didn't say that. Well, I don't think that's a controversial no. issue. No, it, it's, it's something that uh, you know, I think we should again come back to as, as we go forward in the sessions. And again, these Q&As are really intended to key off uh, a lot of larger discussions. Um, I know with the uh, uh, particular situation of 
what data gets displayed and what data doesn't get displayed, um, there's the idea of something called an emergency responder EHR. Um, and the application of that emergency responder EHR is that's when the patient is showing up in the emergency room and you need to find out if they're lithium toxic or not. I wasn't, sorry. Yeah, I wasn't trying to imply that it's controversial. I was trying to say a lot of these things have been around for a while in the paper world. Mm -hmm. And some of the logic in the paper world actually does apply in the electronic world as well. And some of the issues that I think we should push ahead on is what is the emergency role of the EHR versus the patient-controlled, patient-centered care role of the EHR. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Uh, Mary jo? Well, I just wanted to uh, congratulate the organizers and say thank you for bringing in CDC and for OMIC for the emphasis on wellness and health. Because although in many discussions, the word health, the word wellness comes in, it's like oil floating on top of water in all these HIV discussions. And even as I look through all the materials here, this is still heavily clinically oriented, heavily medical model driven. But if you're looking at the business cases, if you're looking at the standards issues, then it's imperative that the concerns, opportunities, influences, forces, stakeholders in the health and wellness world be absolutely integrated into all aspects of these discussions instead of always just sort of layered now, now what we're going to do next is we're going to go right into the track breakouts. We are running a little bit, but not very much behind. Uh, we actually don't have a break scheduled right now, but we do um, need people to move to the track breakout rooms. So, uh, so if you're in the business model track, or if you're interested in that, stay put, uh, because that's going to be right here. Um, the uh, technical and standards track is going to be in the ballot auditorium, um, and the societal models track will be in uh, the Lee room. And, and before we leave, so around uh, 6.15, around 6.15 or so, uh, when those tracks finish up, you can go and, uh, and get a nice drink on the first floor. Um, uh, where we'll uh, have a reception, at, and a few minutes after that, there'll, there'll be uh, drinks and hors d'oeuvres, and then a few, a few minutes after that, 20, 30 minutes after that, there'll be um, a uh, hearty, re hearty uh, reception with food uh, downstairs, uh, one level below. And then finally, one, one, one question, we have not, very specifically, we have not gone around and said, we'd like you to be in this track, we'd like you to be in this track, we'd like you to be in this track. Be in this track. However, there are such, several organizations which have brought multiple people. Uh, and if you do have, and again, we've had to limit the attendance of this event very tightly. If you have brought multiple people from your organization, we would like you to split up. Um, you know, it's very important that we, even if you're coming from similar backgrounds, it's very important that we get that, uh, we get that input from your and, group. And in my role as, uh, as Kajal, everybody, we will get done at 6.15. Yes. Yeah. Yes.